Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Collum, and welcome to this next edition of Human Landing Site Study Hangouts, or HLS2 Hangouts, a joint presentation by NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate and the Science Mission Directorate here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate and the Today's briefing on surface power considerations and how they affect latitude choices builds on the conversation that started at the first human landing site exploration zone workshop for human missions to the surface of Mars, which was held in October 2015 in Houston, Texas. Before I introduce today's presenters, let's get to know our HLS2 steering committee co-chairs, Ben Bussey and Rick Davis. Ben is chief exploration scientist in NASA's human exploration operations and mission directorate and Rick is Assistant Director for Science and Exploration in NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Hi, guys. Hi. If you have anything you want to say. No, just really looking forward to, to the presentation today. Yeah, and I, we I just echo what Ben said. Uh, is these, ta these talks are really key for sort of a under better understanding where you can pick a landing site. So this is um, really, and I'm very excited about this one. So it'll be cool. All right. Thanks, Ben and Rick. Let's introduce our presenters. Joining us here in the NASA TV studio is Len Dzinski of NASA headquarters here in Washington, DC. Len is the chief technologist for the Planetary Sciences Division in the Science Mission Directorate, and will discuss power technology for planetary science and how it can be synergistic with support for human Mars surface power. Hi, Len. Hello, and uh, thank you. I look forward to talking to you all today about uh, some of the technologies that we use for powering spacecraft for robotic exploration and how they might benefit uh, human landing sites on Mars. And joining us virtually are Lee Mason and Tom Kerslake from Glenn Research Center. Tom is a solar array engineer and will discuss the impacts of selected Mars landing site options on solar power generation. Hi, Tom. It's great to be here, thanks. And Lee is the Principal Technologist for Power in the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Lee will talk to us about the technology drivers for, and current Mars surface power development efforts. Hi, Lee. Hi, everybody. Looking forward to the meeting. Surface power development efforts. Hi, Lee. All right. Well, let's get going. Off to you, Lee. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to get us started here with a few slides to get the, the ball rolling. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge at this point Michelle Rucker from Johnson Space Center, who also contributed to this package. Um, can you do sound on yours, Rick, so we can get one of the speakers you're talking about? Thanks. Okay, uh, as we introduce the topic of Mars surface power, there's a couple of key points we'd like to, to make here. Uh, first of all, it, it's been made you know, very clear to us that the choice of Mars surface power technology is going to be very dependent on the human landing site, which is, makes this topic all the more relevant. Uh, certainly, we recognize the fact that Mars is a difficult environment it, it can pose a lot of challenges to power systems and any system, but for power, the fact that it has reduced solar flux, long night periods, and potentially extended dust storms all contribute to uh, you know, issues that our, us power system engineers have to deal with. Equatorial regions and, and maybe near mid-latitudes as being very accommodating to solar power systems with energy storage, if we need to get to high latitudes, we want to uh, uh, consider a global access of the Mars surface. It, it's possible that we might consider nuclear power systems, especially if we plan to have long surface stays. Other key points, we really haven't made a decision yet on the Mars surface power approach. The good news is we're studying a number of We know uh, to some extent the requirements uh, we think that it's going to be require about you know at least tens of kilowatts to sustain a crude outpost and provide power for potentially ISRU systems on the surface. 
Uh, we know that there's some good ongoing technology development, especially in the directorate I work in the Space Technology Mission Directorate that could help in this process. Uh, and, and we have mission trade studies ongoing within the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate uh, under our Mars study capability team. Bottom line is we're pursuing multiple options. We're looking for flexibility, robustness, and reliability. And we have a number of good ideas in, in the pipeline. Uh, so Mars surface power is a tough thing. Uh, it turns out for robotic missions, we've been pretty good at it. We've launched a number of missions to Mars, including the Phoenix lander that you see in the picture, Mars Science Lab. And we've proven that we can power these spacecraft and meet the robotic uh, mission needs that, that go along with that. But when it comes to crew, we believe that the power requirements are going to exceed the, the level that these previous robotic systems were able to provide. And, and we estimate requirements on the order of 40 kilowatts day and night. Power for ISRU propellant production arrives. We're looking at power for landers, habitats, life support, and maybe recharging rovers after the crew arrives. And we, we foresee a number of options to, to satisfy those needs, be it nuclear fission, solar PV, or energy storage. And, and there are a bunch of things associated with those technologies that we need to consider. One is they need to be compactly stowed for la launch and landing. We probably need to be able to deploy them robotically. It's survivable for multiple crew campaigns. If we're going to invest in this infrastructure, we want it to last for more than one mission. Attributes of the stationary power system, we also foresee portable power needs that might be in the range of 3 to 10 kilowatts. It might require energy storage on the order of 120 kilowatt hours. And, and the options for that include batteries, fuel cells, to power systems. And like the stationary power systems, the portable systems have unique attributes for Mars. Uh, we'd like to have systems that are reliable enough that these rovers can go on 100 kilometer traverses uh, and, and perform remote operations. And we'd like to see that the systems have some interchangeability among its components so that we can leverage uh, you know, other systems to, to uh, meet our needs. Those of you who don't know, Mars, again, is a tough environment. Three-ace gravity, one-third solar flux nominally, greater than 12-hour nights. You have the low-pressure CO2 atmosphere. You have potentially long-duration dust storms, which we're going to hear about later from Tom. And you have some pretty severe wind loads streams, all of which uh, affect the power system. Next, please. We have a number of technologies in the pipeline in our Space Technology Mission Directorate. One of them is called Kilopower. Kilopower is a small fission reactor produced between 1 and 10 kilowatts. Uh, it's, it represents um, an approach for Mars surface power in a, in a design that is adaptable to other mission locations, including deep space or, or moon. Um, it, it's kind of a novel approach in that we're utilizing an existing uranium-235 fuel form that's, uh, that's already in development uh, by the Department of Energy. Uh, we like it for its, its compactness and its modularity. It offers an option uh, for power levels of interest for these Mars surface missions and, and addresses a, a range beyond what radioisotope power systems can provide, which we know work on Mars because they've already been utilized there. It really gets us that next range of power in the 1 to 10 kilowatts to allow for some of these early human missions. Please, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Len, from the Science Mission Directorate. So imagine you're in your home away from home on Mars, 200 million miles from Earth. The temperature outside is minus, minus 60 degrees Celsius, and a storm blows in and knocks out the power lines. Your, uh, your, what comes with that storm is darkness. Uh, the solar uh, power, the power from the arrays may be down as much as 70% from what you have. 
And with being at that cold outside, you need to keep yourself warm. You need to keep your house warm. You cannot just walk outside and gather some firewood and start a fire. And you can't start your portable gas generator because the air won't burn. So power is life. Without life or without power, nothing works. Um, you cannot survive in such a harsh environment, so you need power. For that reason, we need to supply our astronauts with a robust and reliable power supply, a robust and reliable power architecture, a set of power supplies that can, that can supply the astronauts with power throughout a range of conditions and contingencies. NASA has been relying on radioisotope power uh, generated from the heat of decay from plutonium-238 for over 50 years. It's provided ro robust and reliable power for robotic exploration of the solar system. And that can be part of a robust architecture for human exploration of Mars as well. Part of what we do as NASA technologists is look for opportunities where technologies that are being demonstrated or being uh, used reliably, reliably for other purposes can be used to benefit uh, human exploration. If you've seen the movie The Martian, recall the scene where uh, stranded astronaut Mark Watney goes on and on digs the rover uh, that's uh, powered by an RTG and uses the RTG on his human rover to keep himself warm. So the heat from radioisotope power can also be a utility as well as the electricity. RPS could be part of this robust power architecture that could be supplying uh, power for the astronaut's exploration of the surface of Mars. It supplies constant reliable heat and constant reliable electric power that could be used in an auxiliary sense. Radioisotope power systems are compact and transportable. They weigh maybe as much as uh, uh, 100 kilograms, perhaps as, uh, as much as a human being on the surface of Mars would weigh. Um, they enhance mission flexibility because you can transport them, you can use them for multiple purposes. They're safe for humans to work around in close proximity with a minimal amount of shielding. And as I mentioned, uh, and as, as Mark Watney knew, the waste heat from the power conversion can also be used as a utility. However, the use of radioisotope power doesn't come without some issues that we're, we would have to deal with if we decide to commit to this. Because plutonium-238, being used as a heat source, is in limited supply, and it all, it's also expensive to produce, um, we can't really consider radioisotope power for large-scale use on the surface of Mars. It would primarily be your auxiliary power system. But we could consider maybe one or three kilowatts of electric power or perhaps about 12 kilowatts of thermal power if we wanted to heat, heat our habitats with it. Uh, we would also need some significant development time in order to scale up the production of plutonium-238 and develop the kind of larger scale power supply that we would need for human operations, um, a little bit larger than what we use for, uh, for science missions right now. We'd consider something on the order of 500 watts electric uh, for a power system that we might use for uh, larger science missions as well as, as human missions. It takes a, a significant time to develop these power systems, perhaps as much as a decade. So if we're talking about going to Mars in the 2030s, we need to start planning to pretty soon if we want to use radioisotope power. Now using plutonium for science missions, uh, we've been using it for over 50 years for science missions. Um, we focus on, on the safety uh, of these systems when we develop them. It's a significant part of our effort. Uh, because of that, there's a lot of regulatory concerns and a lot of testing that needs to be done for radioisotope power to, be, to gain the necessary approvals from the Office of the President for launch. Uh, we're working with the Department of Energy uh, to make a uh, efficient use of radioisotope power and to make the processes for launching and using radioisotope power more efficient and more affordable. And that's also part of what we would be doing for human exploration. And with that, Lee, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you, Len. Uh, that was a great uh, discussion about radioisotope power, uh, which we know works on Mars because it's working on the Curiosity rover right now. Next slide, please, Bob. So in an effort to show the diversity of options that are available from our surface, certainly solar and energy storage is one of the key uh, options under the Space Technology Mission Directorate Game Changing Development Program. We're funding a seedling study called SAWS, Solar Array with Storage, 
The goal is to develop a credible solar array and energy storage alternative to nuclear fission. And uh, studies have, are already ongoing to look at uh, in, innovative designs, including the one in the top right corner that shows um, six wings that, that would be deployed from a central lander. Uh, those wings could um, provide essentially up to 50 kilowatts uh, during the lunar day uh, uh, near the equator used to charge regenerative fuel cells power up to 10 kilowatts. And so it is an, a very interesting and innovative approach to making power on, on the surface of Mars and, and one that deals with the challenges that we spoke to uh, previously, that being the, the lower solar insulation streams and the potential for dust storms. And so uh, this is one idea. It, it utilizes a, a, um, a innovative deployment mechanism, compact telescoping array, which you see in the lower right corner, uh, a technology that's been developed at Langley Research Center and could be readily applied to a, a system like you see in the top right corner. And right now the studies are ongoing. We're looking at the performance of this technology, comparing it to some of the other options and looking at how it might be integrated into a Mars architecture. Please, Bob. And Lee, uh, maybe it's a, I think it's a question for you, but maybe Lynn could weigh in as well. It's from Fred Cal. Uh, what is the mass to energy ratio versus solar of say nuclear systems, but also uh, sort of the assessment of complexity versus complexity of nuclear versus solar. I'm not sure who's the best one. We'll have to be careful we don't step on each other with them. Uh, Lee, you want to start? Well, uh, that's a pretty broad question, and I think all of us could probably contribute to the answer. Um, for the nuclear system, uh, at 10 kilowatts, we're talking about 1,500 kilograms of landed mass, uh, and that supplies 10 kilowatts day and night. Uh, the mass numbers for the SAWS approach are still being formulated. I would say we don't quite have the equipment equivalent number, and the system performance would vary depending on where it would be located on the surface. Um, RPS, I think Len mentioned that a, a, a one kilowatt system would weigh, what, Len, about 100 kilograms? Yeah, if it were, uh, I think, I think, Lee, that we could consider uh, 100 kilowatts to weigh about 100, I'm sorry, um, one kilowatt to weigh about 100 kilograms, about 10 watts per kilogram. It would be uh, a ballpark for a more advanced radioisotope power system. And that for the nuclear fission options, the, the system mass I quoted includes all the pieces, parts that you would need, including the radiation shielding, which is much more significant for a nuclear fission reactor, reactor than it would be for a radioisotope power system. Lynn, anything you want to add to that? No, thanks. Okay. Should we move on? Loss versus and complexity of nuclear versus solar, and what your all's thoughts were that. Maybe we can start with Lynn and then go back to you, Lee. Um, cost for developing radioisotope power, as I mentioned, is something that we're working on with the Department of Energy. In the past, it's it's been. Um, perhaps as much as 200 or 400 million dollars to develop a new radioisotope power system. Um, that's something that we're working to uh, reduce in the future, but right now that would be a good ballpark for what it would cost to develop a new radioisotope power system. And Lee, over to you, thoughts? Because I think uh, solar and uh, nuclear fission are probably the primary, so th thoughts on uh, cost guesstimates well certainly that's still uh, something that we're we're working on I don't think we have uh, precise cost numbers yet uh, certainly in both cases there's development required uh, for the nuclear fission system we're fortunate to have the ongoing technology development project aimed at doing some real testing soon uh, solar I think would would to a great extent leverage other solar uh, array developments but certainly there would be some custom uh, work needed to be done to address the Mars requirements. So that 
I can give you precise cost numbers at this point. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. No, we'll keep pressing them. Queue up the next chart. Uh, we do have a, a plan, and this is a very notional plan uh, to address that primary power uh, need for the um, stationary uh, system. Uh, we have ongoing tech development uh, that we can we can leverage right now with respect to kilopower and saws. We'd like to see that eventually evolve into a, a ground test program campaign where we would build engineering units and, and test them in Mars simulation uh, facilities. Uh, those uh, engineering units could be adapted for flight and potentially be utilized on a ro robotic precursor mission that may occur in the mid to late 2020s. Uh, that would provide the confidence that these technologies would be well suited to uh, provide power for human missions. Uh, uh, we would see some period in which we would adapt them for those missions and then in the in the 30s fly these systems and and supply the power needed for our human uh, next slide please Bob so I'm going to turn it over now to Tom Kerslake uh, who's our uh, resident expert on um, solar arrays and, and the Mars uh, in, uh, environment effects on those. You're going to hear a lot about how uh, Mars latitude may affect our, our approach on solar power, right? Right. Thanks, Lee. Yeah. Tom, and uh, let's start off with the first chart. But just, just an opening comment, Mars is one of the solar system's terrestrial planets, so it's very much like Earth. So depending on where you are on the surface of Earth and what season it is and even the time of day, the amount of sunlight uh, that you're going to experience will be different. And Mars in that regard is similar to Earth. And of course, the amount of sunlight you have is very important if you have a solar power system. Uh, I happen to be sitting in front of uh, a small solar array, a collection of solar cells that you put together, place them in the sun, and they generate electricity. Referring to the first chart, uh, solar power on the surface of Mars has been used very, very effectively. Uh, there's several photographs of some of the rovers. Uh, more recent times, the Mars Exploration Rovers, MER, uh, two of those rovers have operated for many, many years on Mars. Those are shown in the upper two photographs. Pathfinder rover that was launched uh, quite a few number of years ago uh, that survived on the surface of Mars and, and worked very well. And then back in 2008, uh, the Mars Phoenix lander photograph shown in the bottom of the uh, uh, landed on the uh, polar regions of Mars. And it operated very well for a short period of time. Common with all these solar rays that have worked on the surface of Mars is they're all pretty small. They're only a few square meters in size, about a few hundred watts of power. So for a Mars surface human base, we're looking to have thousands of square meters or hundreds or 500 times more area and a lot more power. So we have to rethink that. Next chart, please. So one of the challenges of uh, operating a solar array on the surface of Mars is how much the sunlight varies. And uh, back on Earth, the, uh, Mars moves closer to the sun. The sun is stronger, and Mars moves further away from the sun, and the sun gets weaker. On Earth, that effect is about 7% over the years. But on Mars, it's about almost 40% difference. So we have to accommodate that change in flux that would reach the planet Mars the planet. It has to travel through the atmosphere and get down to the, the surface. The sun angles and the, the, the tilt angle of the surface where you are on, on the latitude of, of your landing site on the planet will affect the path length of that, that sunlight through the atmosphere. 
more sun gets scattered and obscured. Uh, is, a, is an atmosphere that is constantly uh, fine dust particles, and these dust particles are are falling out of the ap atmosphere, precipitating. So the more dust that happens to be in the atmosphere, the more sunlight's going to get scattered and blocked. Look at the local surface landing site, how much sunlight might be reflected off the, the surface will change as well. So at the bottom depict uh, a landing site uh, at 19 degrees north latitude and one uh, below the equator at 15 degrees south latitude. Those two photographs show that in the, in the south the atmosphere is a little bit more dusty. Lee uh, had mentioned that occasionally major dust storms kick up. The photograph in the lower right shows from orbit a major dust storm kicking up. Uh, an extreme amount of dust gets loaded into the atmosphere, and of course the sunlight uh, quite a bit. All right, for those of you guys to like math, here are some, uh, some plots you uh, see on the screen. But what's being depicted is a solar intensity versus a Mars year. This last, uh, gosh, almost about 800 days. So when the curve goes up, that means stronger sunlight. The curve goes down, it's weaker. The side is in the, far, is in the north, 50 degrees north. And the top curve is how much sun is reaching uh, Mars as a planet, and the lower curve shows how much reaches the, the surface. So if you look about in the middle of the plot on the left-hand side, you can see how much that curve dips at the bottom, a 7 to 1 reduction in, in sunlight at northern latitude during the northern winter. The win northern winter happens when the North Pole is facing, the planet's rotational axis is facing away from the sun. And the surface, the sun would be much lower in the sky, so you get less sunlight. Different story if you're in the south, if you look at the plot on the right, right-hand side at 30 degrees south, in the summertime, in the middle of the plot, this is much sunlight is on the surface of Mars that is reaching the planet. So at that period of time, you're going to be able to generate a lot of solar power. Next chart. Well, so far I've been talking about how much sunlight you get under so-called clear sky conditions where you only have the background dustiness of the Mars atmosphere. Every once in a while, uh, major dust storms kick up. And a major storm means that the whole planet basically gets encircled with uh, dusty skies. A series of photographs uh, of the planet Mars taken from space. And the photograph on the left shows when under clear skies you can see the surface features major dust storm hit, and it covered all of Mars with a dust storm. And in most of the planet, the, the surface features are obscured. You can't see them. The, the South Pole, you can still see that South Polar cap. So the amount of dust does vary depending on where you are on Mars. And that's illustrated with that photograph. Next chart, please. So in any given Martian year, you might get one, two, or no major dust storms. And they, they cover the full globe. They, they last for several months, about three months in time. They do obscure the sun. They have high so-called OD values, or optical depth, uh, kind of a measure of opacity, or how, uh, how the sunlight gets scattered and doesn't reach, reach the surface of Mars. The, the storms tend to kick up in the south. South, you're going to tend to see a higher amount of dustiness in the atmosphere. So uh, NASA has developed uh, computer models to mo model this behavior depending on the, the season and your landing site latitude and the time during the mission. Telescopes and orbiting spacecraft have looked at Mars and they, they've observed a chance, a, a third, that at any given year might have one, two, or no major dust storms time in the last decade or so, uh, like the period of time that the Mars Exploration Rovers have been there, the dust storms have been less frequent, only about one in three years. The graphic on the lower left uh, depicts an artist's concept of what a dust storm might look like when it's rolling in on an astronaut. For the Mars Exploration Rover, with a, a sensor, you can measure that optical depth. 
the plot, there's a red arrow that shows that, that peak in the, in the uh, function going up. And that's showing the optical depth going up to about a value of four, about a half or one. So the, the opacity of the atmosphere increases in many factors. So we get, a, major, we get a, a dust storm, and the question becomes, well, geez, how much, how much solar flux are we going to lose? How much power might we expect to lose? And this another plot uh, through the Martian year here, heard lines showing different landing sites. And if you see the, the, the plot that looks uh, kind of orange or, or reddish, uh, that's at the landing site uh, in the south, 30 degrees south. Hits at about 500 sols or days into the mission, you get about a three times reduction in the amount of solar flux. So that, that's very dramatic. Uh, elsewhere on that plot, it shows that the minimum solar flux value is about the same amount. So dramatic, even though you lose three times, you're not any worse than you are in the winter time at that same landing site. If you go into the north, that's the blue curve on the bottom at 50 degrees north, you get a very modest reduction because the skies aren't so dusty get maybe a 30% loss in power site. And at that period of time where you're heading into local winter, that loss of 30% power, uh, something that you will have to design for and size your power system a little bit bigger to make up for that loss. So I guess we're ready for the next chart. All right. So with this knowledge of uh, the variability of solar power on the surface of Mars, what might your solar array look like in terms of its configuration? I mentioned, and Len had mentioned how, how big the solar array is going to be. It's going to be 1,000 square meters, uh, roughly, module. So that, that's, a, that's a large area that's larger than we've flown ever in space. So you got to push that up within your lander into a compact volume and then deploy it out on the Mars surface ready to make the power. Uh, you want the solar cell technology cell that just makes use of the available sunlight without the use of optics or lenses or reflectors to concentrate the sunlight that is sometimes done. And the reason for that is just because of the diffuse nature of the sunlight on Mars. Uh, your solar ray can be configured in a flat plate that just sits there in one orientation. It might be horizontal to the ground. This is a very simple configuration. It's the configuration that has flown on Mars, on all the rovers and landers thus far. And it's a, it's a very good configuration. Uh, it gives you very good power when you're near the equator, but you probably get a little less power when you're further north or south. And because you're flat, the top of the solar array can collect all this dust, and that's a major problem. Taking that flat panel and just tilting it to the side, and that might help the dust fall off naturally. We have some evidence to suggest that may happen. Tilt the solar array and maybe put a couple of these tilted solar arrays together. You can form a tent type structure. And that gives you a nice stiff, strong structure, which is a, which is a good approach on the surface of Mars. So dust control. And, but the one problem in doing that is you may not see the sun quite as well and you'll generate less power, maybe 20% less power. So that's a, an engineering trade off that we have to consider. Lastly, we could consider taking our, our flat panels and trying to track them to follow the sun through the day. You can do that, and that might give you a small boost in power, 10%. Uh, it may allow you to tilt your solar rays over so that the dust can fall off. Things on Mars that can kick up and get to be pretty high speed, and you may want to feather your solar ray into that wind edge on so it doesn't catch as much wind load. That's a possible approach as well. But doing that means you have to have mechanisms that will move the solar array, and that's a complexity and a, and a mass penalty as well. Just one last thought on solar array configuration. Uh, on Mars, the wind blows. It, it can lift up small grains of sand and move those, those dunes. If, if your solar panel is flat and lying on the surface, you have to be careful that it doesn't get so, co covered with uh, sand. And you want to keep the surface of the solar array up to Mars in case there are boulders or other obstacles so the solar array does not get damaged. Next chart, please. All right, we've been 
the surface of Mars, um, solar array mission and all the space missions, the environments are, are very severe compared to the surface of Earth. Um, is, is relatively benign. Is it's not all that bad for space solar arrays, and I say that because of the, the thin atmosphere is protective of space radiation, like protons and electrons. So the solar cells are not expected to degrade as a result of that radiation because the atmosphere blocks it. Similarly, there's very small meteors uh, flying at high speed, and those will hit into structures and damage solar cells in space. On the surface of Mars, that's eliminated from that the Mars atmosphere. You do have temperature extremes, but again, the cold temperature don't seem to be, are not as severe as other space missions. Mars surface goes, it's not a bad place to be if you're a solar ray, with one big exception, and that is it's a dusty environment. The dust is going to collect on everything. That, that's, a, that's a major challenge that we do have to address. When the sunlight gets on top of solar cells, it blocks the sunlight, and you, you put out less power from that, that solar cell. If the wind is kicking up and blowing at high speed, some, the dust is in the wind, and it could hit the surface and potentially scratch it, and that could degrade the power output. Dust on Mars, it, it might actually be corrosive. There are so-called superoxides or peroxides or, or perchlorates, and these are chemicals that can react with the uh, surface or solar ray materials and perhaps degrade them. Where human life's at stake and we have many, many billions of dollars invested, we want to make sure that our solar rays can be operated and be cleared of dust uh, so that we can get a reliable power level. Next chart. All right, this is, this is some pretty clear evidence about dust on Mars. This is a selfie photo of the Mars Exploration Rover, one of them. Photo, it shows uh, the beginning of the mission. The solar ray uh, is depicted on the top of the rover there. It's very clear. You can clearly see the dark uh, blue-black solar cells. Months later, there's another selfie that the rover took of itself. This time, it's covered with dust. And in that case, you can barely see the solar cells. So we've measured the loss of, of power, and it comes out to be about a tenth of percent per Mars day called a sol. So if that went on for one Mars year, you would have no power whatsoever. Very serious thing if we wanted to do missions that last more than one Mars year or even a fraction of a Mars year. So that colorful plot at the bottom of the, of the picture shows the Mars Exploration Rover data, how much, basically how much dust is uh, and how much power is obscured. It starts at one and falls off to about a half on the plot. But then when the plot recovers, about midway through that plot, you, you jump back up and you recover about 90% of your power. And that was fortunate, and it was associated with a high wind clearing event where high winds went over the rover and blowed off the dust. All right, so. We have to think about dust management for a Mars uh, human base. Uh, the, the dust in Mars atmosphere is very fine. It's constantly falling out of the air, and it will tend to cling to surfaces. Uh, many of the surfaces on a Mars base will have issue with this. You'll have to manage it. Solar rays will be one of the largest area surfaces, so we, we have a big challenge ahead of us. And we can either try to avoid the, the dust collection to begin with. That's called abatement for static fields. If you set up electrodes with a voltage uh, around the solar array, the, the dust is charged and will tend to be deflected. You could simply tilt the surfaces and let the dust fall off. You take active means to remove that dust. And one of the nice ways of doing that is with a, a piezoelectric shaker. I mean, all the cell phones have little piezoelectric devices in them when your, 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 your phone call or your, your text comes in, it vibrates. So it's the same kind of deal. You energize it and it vibrates and it will shake the dust off. Or you could have mechanical wipers like your car windshield wipers or perhaps just a peel and discard film like, a, or you could get out a leaf blower type of thing, just like the, the high winds on Mars, like a dust devil might clear off the dust, you could clear off the dust that way. Thinking that these arrays might be there when people aren't there, and one of the best ways to, to do 
this dust removal would be to have these piezoelectric actuators that could be easily turned on and off. They can be integrated with the solar cells and at relatively low mass. And so we, we avoid a lot of penalties associated with this, this uh, particular method. Regardless of what method we use, we, we will want to have the experiments to prove out that our dust management works. The next chart. Uh, if I might, this is Rick, kind of ask a few questions. Uh, so first of all, um, from Doug, can you guys give a sense of like, if you know it, uh, power cons required to actually produce uh, propellant of Mars? And you may not have the kind of numbers. I think they're in the tens. Well, I'm certain they're in the tens of kilowatt for electric. But if you can have any thoughts on that, or if you do. And I realize we don't have a propellant person here, so we may not know the answer. Lee, maybe start with you. Could you repeat the question, Rick? Your audio broke up. Sorry. Right. So it's a question about power levels required to produce uh, LOX and or uh, liquid oxygen, and um, and if you're producing methane, you know, in, in, um, and they give a sense of how much power is required to, to do that. Yeah. So there are two uh, basic approaches to to acquiring uh, local you know materials at Mars. One is to get it from the atmosphere. Uh, getting getting it out of the CO2 and, and getting the oxygen from the CO2. The other is to dig uh, for material, uh, hopefully ice that would be nearby. You could acquire and get oxygen from the, the water embedded in the ice. Um, so I think both of those have uh, kind of unique power requirements. Uh, for the atmospheric one, you have to uh, you have to atmosphere up and, and then run it through a, a process, a reactor to uh, extract the usable material uh, option. You have to have, you know, uh, equipment to dig. Uh, and so that has a different kind of requirement. But in, in both cases, I'm, I'm pretty sure as I understand it, the requirements are similar overall, like in the tens of kilowatts. So that's that what is really what drove our our need to generate or to develop these systems to supply uh, tens of kilowatts up to 40 or 50 for a um, a, a base, uh, and that's the way to get started. That might not be ultimately where you'd want to be, but it's enough for us to get started to make the oxygen that the crew might use uh, for breathing and for propellant to return back to Earth. Okay, and then uh, Ben has a comment. Too. Just just a couple of comments to mention that. Um, NASA is flying an instrument called MOXIE on Mars 2020, which will demonstrate some of the technologies for extraction of oxygen from the atmosphere. And the other thing to bear in mind when you're thinking about how much power does it take is this activity can predominantly be done before the crew are there. So it's not additional power that's needed on top of what you're allowing for the crew. You know, we can be generating the fuel for the return and using the power systems before the crew are there. Yes. And uh, two other things, uh, Michael Heck, who's actually working on Moxie, is there's a nice, uh, he's got a number of nice points in the chat, so take a look at that. And then secondly, um, Fred Callip has a, a comment which I'd like to get your feedback on. He goes, the MER opportunity solar panels don't seem to have accumulated any damage, saltating and oxidation from perchlorates at about 0 0.5 meters from the surface. So can you all talk a little bit to that as well? Uh, Rick, I only got part of it. It sounded like the question was related to potential damage of the Mars Exploration Rover solar panels or corrosion of them. That's correct, and his point is that there are is not been a lot of damage. So you'd like to get we'd like to get your comments on that. Um, I'm sorry, the the audio still broke up, Rick. Okay, let's try that again. Uh, so. Fred Callip was asking that the uh, uh, that there does not actually appear to be very much damage due to the perchlorates, and would like to get your thoughts on that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think the perchlorates were were seen at the Mars Phoenix landing site, and again, in, in my chart, I had a question mark for for foregone conclusion that this is an issue. Uh, both the oxides and the perchlorates tend to be more chemically aggressive in the presence of water. And in the ambient Mars surface environment, there's very, very little water. Uh, it's extremely dry. So then the question becomes, are we going to be doing anything to change that? 
for example, if you tend to be at a more northern landing site and there's near surface permafrost and you stick a solar array there or a landing leg, you could change the thermal properties such that you could be melting the water ice and generating water. So we don't anticipate it that it is a problem, but we would definitely like to confirm that it is not for the materials of interest. Okay, and the uh, last question that we have right now in the queue is, do you all have a sort of, you said tens of kilowatts electric, I think the real number is like 40. It's 40, yes. 40, and that assumes you're doing things like Ben talked about, you're producing propellant when the crew's not there, and, and the, the HAB and lab numbers are comparable. And so you're sort of trading those off against each other. Um, is that 40 a good number in general right now in terms of what y'all are assuming? Yes. Okay. And Lee, any comments on that too? I, I was just going to add one thing. Yeah, the number is in the 40 to 50 kilowatt range based on our, our studies so far. But one of the big requirements uh, for the uh, making the propellant before the crew arrives is to keep that propellant cold. And so uh, part of that 40 to 50 kilowatts is the, uh, the power to, to drive cryocoolers to maintain that uh, propellant at temperature. And, and that all contributes to it. But fortunately, you know, once the crew arrives, you can shut down your propellant production plant and use that power for other things that the crew would, would take advantage of. Okay, great, thanks. And then uh, another question that came in uh, has to do with the ability to perhaps eventually make solar panels at Mars and the ease or difficulty of that. Maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, it's always a good goal to try to make use of in-situ uh, resources that are available, whether it's the regolith or water ice. Uh, in the near term, uh, the, the plan is to uh, and precisely make solar panels on the surface of Earth, check them out before launch and before arriving at Mars so that we can guarantee that they're going to function properly. And in-situ resource utilization activity requires a lot of infrastructure accommodate that. It, it requires the plant itself to uh, to make the material that you have to uh, producing. And that in itself takes a lot of uh, resources. And then once you make your product, you have to inspect it and make sure that it's working properly. And all that takes a lot of, lot of effort. So in the surface of Mars and the materials that are available, it's, it's a huge challenge to try to make photovoltaics, even those at very, very low conversion efficiencies. Okay, great, thanks. I'll let you guys keep going. Okay. So this is our, our walk-off slide uh, where we can certainly uh, entertain further questions. But obviously, I hope we've made it clear that, that Mars surface power for human-scale missions is a, is a tough job, a, a huge development challenge, and what we're calling a long pole, uh, mainly because no off-the-shelf options exist to meet the power requirements that we foresee for Mars uh, human bases. And further, the environment and the fact that we're likely to have multiple distributed landing sites, those, all, those things all, all also contribute to the, the challenge of making electrical power on Mars. Uh, the good news is we have some options and we're putting investments in those options to, to develop them further. Solar PV could potentially leverage investments that are going on in, in solar electric propulsion, where we also need very large arrays. Uh, it's not likely that those same arrays could be used on Mars, but a lot of lessons learned could be applied to the Mars application. And on the, the small fission side, we have kilopower in which we're going to be demonstrating a, a reactor in a 2017 nuclear test out in Nevada. And we believe that that technology really represents a, a strong foundation for uh, developing a Mars capability uh, with, with nuclear fission. Uh, the good news is uh, we need to well, not so much good, but we need to close these gaps. There's work to be done. 
Uh, we need to continue to focus and sustain our investments. Uh, the projects that are ongoing need to be funded and completed. Uh, perhaps we need funding augmentations. Uh, we just lost that. Um, anyway, the, good, the, the fact is, uh, if we can keep these things on track, uh, we're likely to get technologies that are going to help us to bring humans to Mars someday, hopefully in the early... Thanks. Okay, and uh, okay. Lynn, any other comments or anything? So in a conclusion, I know that y'all did that jointly, which is great. No, I, I would I would second what Lee is saying. I think that um, there are challenges to providing a robust architecture to support a human uh, Mars space on in the 2030s, but a lot of the technologies that we're going to need to enable that architecture are being worked on today in a number of forms. Um, as Lee mentioned, um, the kilopower fission uh, is something that is, is being developed specifically for that um, activity, but it's something that could be used for other missions, other NASA missions, and so there's interest uh, in the agency in developing that capability. Um, in planetary science, we continue to develop advanced technologies for radioized power systems, which I think would supply, uh, you know, a good uh, auxiliary power system for uh, human exploration of Mars. Um, it could support a number of activities and solar panels and solar arrays and, and energy storage technologies are, are all things that are in development for other missions across the agency. Certainly it's part of our activities in planetary science. Um, and a lot of our missions use, uh, use advanced solar technologies and we're interested in continuing to advance those technologies. So. Um, as, as the agency works uh, to develop uh, capabilities for its broad set of missions, we are advancing uh, what we need to do for humans on Mars, and that's a good thing. Okay, and two other questions in the queue. One, can someone talk to the prevalence of dust storms in the southern latitudes versus northern latitudes and what that means for solar power production? Yeah, this... This is Tom. Um, yeah, the the southern regions uh, south of the equator, uh, they they tend to get higher surface solar fluxes, and there are surface regions where the albedo varies, and the albedo is a measure of how much sunlight is reflected. So you get the surface in one area, the other, which tends to uh, make the atmosphere a little bit more turbulent and can give rise to the dust devils, the, the mini tornadoes, just like uh, that occur in the desert southwest of the United States. And that's one of the mechanisms for dust loading from the surface up into the atmosphere. It worse in the south, uh, past observations, at least for, uh, showed that a regional dust storm would tend to kick up about 30 degrees south latitude. And then that dust storm would expand until it, it uh, the whole globe more or less. So for solar power, uh, again, being at the, the south, it is, tends to be good under clear sky conditions. Um, storm kicks up, you get a dramatic reduction. Uh, I, I'm predicting like a three to one reduction in solar flux, where the power would really drop off. But at the same time, I'm, I'm showing that the, the resulting solar flux level does not what you would expect to get at the same site uh, under clear sky conditions at the heart of winter time for that site. So it seems very reasonable that we could we could deal with this. And that effect is that your solar array and your energy storage system will just have to be sized bigger. So you pay a mass penalty to ensure that you have enough power. Your system, you tend to operate more at your design point whether the skies are clear or with dust. Uh, you only have to, uh, your performance is uh, able to put out one power level. And uh, sort of a second question uh, is that um, if nuclear fission obviously is sort of a workhorse for the long term in terms of giving you power year round at, very, at much higher levels um, and not being exposed to these dust storms and other types of things. In the short run, I would like to get would like to get your thoughts on this. 
if you're doing short stay missions initially as you develop the, the surface capabilities and you're in the north uh, are your solar flux levels in the north comparable to what they would be in other words in the summertime and to what they'd be down the equator I think your chart suggests that it might be or will be very close. Please solar arrays. Potential. Yeah, sorry, the audio was breaking up again. Uh, I, I heard uh, nuclear fission versus solar, perhaps in the near term, and then latitude effect again on solar power. Uh, no. So the point being is that you could be in a higher latitude location on solar arrays as long as you're there during the summertime. If you're only doing short stays. It oh, could be correct. Level yeah. probably comparable is what they would be at the equator. Is that a true statement? Correct. That, that is a true statement. And in fact, the Mars Phoenix mission did exactly that. It landed at, I think it was 60 degrees north latitude, which is in the polar region. And it had like a three month, about a 90 sol mission duration, and that landed and operated uh, more near the summertime in the northern hemisphere, and it had no problem. So, you know, to, just to follow on to that, though, Rick, I think one consideration is if we're going to go to Mars for the long haul and we're eventually going to establish a, a permanent human presence, the sooner we demonstrate technologies that can provide that uh, kind of capability, I th think the better off we will be. So, um, you know, and, and I really believe that probably a combination of all the things we've talked about uh, having a diversity of, of technologies to, to meet the electrical needs is probably very prudent. Uh, and so I would, would like to see nuclear fission along with solar arrays, along with energy storage and radioisotope, uh, all part of the architecture, because uh, I think that gives us our best chance to, to meet the, the human mission requirements. Okay, so. Well, um, sorry for our camera trouble, but that wraps up today's HLS2 Hangout. We'd like to thank our presenters and thank you all for joining us. We encourage the HLS2 community to continue the conversation. So if you have thoughts and ideas on what knowledge gaps we should address, uh, please contact us at nasa-mars-exploration-zones at mail.nasa.gov. Um, as always, send any questions, comments, and feedback there as well. Uh, you can also find more HLS2 resources, including presentations, our workshop statement, and these Hangouts on our website. Um, and we'll be sending out this video uh, as soon as we have it finished recorded. Uh, ben, Rick, any final words? Ben. No, just uh, as always, very interesting stuff, and I shall go back and watch again and digest some more. Yeah, and I just want to thank all of our speakers today. This is really great, and it's, it's really cool to see how all this comes together. So thank you. And again, we thank you for joining us. And on behalf of NASA's Human Landing Site Study Steering Committee, see you soon.